And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. All right, you can see verse 12, judgment. Books are open, they're judged out of the books, and they pay for their sin. I saw the dead small and great, no distinction in the eyes of God, no respect of persons. Throughout the Bible's the uh, rule of thumb, small and great. Stand before God, the Bible says, the rich and the poor meet together, the Lord is the maker of them all. Small and great. Uh, therefore, when Paul's called to do some witnessing, he says, witnessing both to small and great. Uh, so each stands before the judgment. And so the big boys need a witness just like anybody else. Small and great stand before God. And the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. All right. Book of life be in the Bible. And the books with the records in. All right. Your record stacking up against this book right here. And if according to this book it comes out as sin, then it, goes, it remains as sin in the record books. All right, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell deliver, de delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, then you can see from the illustrations, and you can see how the Lord handles things at the beginning of the millennium, second advent, beginning of the millennium, end of the millennium. You can see the proverb would be true. A wise king scattereth the wicked, and bringeth the wheel over them. Judgment, once it's determined that they've got it coming, judgment comes their way. 27, the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Uh, now another thing I guess I should maybe call your attention to before I maybe even hit 27, is the picture of, uh, definitely of a millennial picture, Ezekiel chapter 1. I won't bother reading the thing, but uh, you got a lot of wheels spinning there. Got a lot of wheels that you deal with. And if you mark down Ezekiel 1, verse 15 through 28, it's a lot of verses. Won't fool with it, but uh, verse number 28 speaks about the glory of the Lord. So it deal with the millennial passage, cherubims, wheels, going every which way. And technically, the verse would come to pass right on the money. And people are dealt with, and so much so that in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse number 13, they're crying out, O wheel, O wheel. Because once the Lord determines they are to be judged, uh, the Bible says, bringeth the wheel over them. And Ezekiel 10, verses 10 to 18, again deals with the glory of the Lord, with Jesus there, and actually people uh, facing such a situation as that. All right, 27, move it on here. The spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. Now, uh, Solomon in his natural state, when I say that, Solomon gathered the Proverbs together here uh, that you're looking at here, all right? The book of Ecclesiastes would be what Solomon gathered together as just a smart man, just a wise man, just a natural man, but, you know, the best he could figure it out, that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Even in his natural state, Solomon acknowledges that man has a spirit. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, this is a passage here that uh, Jehovah Witnesses go to hell on, but it's uh, know what it is. It's a, a man looking at things from a natural standpoint, not thus saith the Lord. And yet here's a fellow that even deducts uh, that man does have a spirit. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3, verse number 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. All right, so he... He has something figured out right. He's got that much right in the fact that uh, man does have a spirit. Now, when I say that, I say that because you have, uh, you have people that are called dichotomous who believe that we are trichotomous, all right? One, two, three. We believe that man has a spirit, soul, body, 1 Thessalonians 5, all right? The dichotomous, he believes man is body and soul. And he doesn't make distinction of body, soul, and spirit. He takes soul and spirit and makes them one. In the Bible, they're distinct. They're not one. Now, here's a man, uh, even in his natural state, had a little better sense than them. All right, the spirit of man. The proverb says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Right, now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice how the Lord makes distinction between your spirit and the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 11. Both mentioned in the... Same verse, and then I want to call your attention to something else and just toss it in for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11. For what man 
knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, little s, spirit of man which is in him. Paul's stating now, and this would be a thus so, saith the Lord situation, that uh, you and I have a spirit. There's more to us than what we look at. You know, somebody says, you know, you witness to someone. Well, you know, what about when you die? When I die, I die like everybody else. You know, I go to the grave and they throw the dirt over me and that's the end. And that's not the end. You've got a spirit and you've got a soul. That may be the end of the body, you know, dust to dust uh, as the thing goes. But uh, you still got a soul and spirit that's going to spend eternity somewhere. And just because the body dies, that's the, that's the temporal side of you. Everything else is eternal. And so, uh, anyhow, spirit of man, which is in him, even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God, capital S. All right, so then you, uh, you want to be able to make distinction. Now, to show you something, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In relation to the work of the Holy Spirit, you notice the capital S. Now, you notice in verse 11 of chapter 2, both mention man's spirit, acknowledge that he has one, man's spirit with little s, the spirit of God with capital S. All right, 1 Corinthians 12. Now, you look at the work of the spirit of God, identified, listed, gifts, administrations, different things that are mentioned there, everything with a capital S. Dealing with the Holy Spirit of God, no question. You wouldn't argue, nobody would argue about that. Now, go to chapter 14. Chapter 14. And all of a sudden, you don't see anything about, you don't see no capital S's. You get dealing with spirit, but you're just dealing with man's spirit. Everything is just small s in chapter number 14. And, you know, if you're ever going to get things right on tongues and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you've got to look at it that way. Look at verse number 2. And look at verse, well, look at verse number 14. There's a clear one. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Uh, then, oh, let's see, down here at about verse number 14. Uh, no, 14, I guess what I gave you. Verse number 32. Verse 32. Uh, and the spirits of the prophets, of the prophets, see, are subject unto the prophets. All right, then the Bible acknowledges you've got a spirit, and it's called the spirit of man in distinction from the Holy Spirit of God. And all the unknown tongues, you don't say anything about the Holy Spirit. Uh, chapter number 12, but diversities of tongues, uh, in verse number 28, I think it is, diverse kinds of tongues, in verse number 10, and chapter number 14, uh, you're talking about the spirit of man. And so you want to sort of think a little bit along those particular lines. Okay, now, uh, go to John chapter 1. And the thing says, the spirit of... Let me get the proverb and read it to you here. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. All right, then evidently what the Lord connects to is your spirit. And where he gives light, and in a sense you give light to the Lord, showing what's on the inside, deals with the spirit. Uh, John chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. The Bible talks about the Lord lighting every man that cometh into the world. John 1, verse number 9. That was a true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All right, now it has to do with more than somebody seeing physically because some people are, like John chapter 9, verse 1, a man's born blind. He comes in blind. And yet the Bible says he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You say, how can it be? Some are born blind. More than just John 9, you probably have heard of situations like that too. Okay, it's what the Lord does on the inside. Not here, but inside. And it says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Okay, the spirit is the part of us inside that God contacts. And when he does, it gives light to the Lord. He gives us light, and we give him light. He goes in there and searches around, and your spirit shows him everything that's in there. Every little thing that's in every nook and cranny, everything's inside of you is shown to the Lord by your spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And that's where the contact is made. 
on the inside. Holy Spirit with your spirit. And it just goes in, just searches around, and sees everything that's in there, all of it. So you want to make sure that you're not just somebody who's got a few things corrected outwardly. Inside is where the Lord does the work. And that a thought. 28. Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. Okay, so here we're looking at the king again. And uh, again, when I see the term, I begin looking for doctrinal application in connection with the millennium. Now, like I said, uh, of course, there's the historical illustrations of a king in the Bible who responded that way. And there's practical lessons for you and I. But uh, nonetheless, mercy and truth preserve the king. Now, go to chapter 29 and look at verse 4. 29, 4. The king by judgment establisheth, establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. All right, by judgment. Uh, in the passage here, it speaks about all mercy and truth. In uh, chapter 29, look at verse number 14. 29, 14, the king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. Okay, now, David the king, when he concludes his remarks, he says, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Then it looks like, say, from a practical standpoint, that uh, people will uh, appear to allow someone rule over them or be a king over them if at times the king is merciful. It's that kind of a thing. Mercy and truth preserve the king. And it appears as though the mercy comes from the king's side. As far as I can see and look at the verse, that's the way it would appear to me. And it would be as though that uh, people accept a king, but you know, every now and then you need mercy. I mean, judgment, but you know, sometimes a little mercy along with the judgment is, sure goes a long ways. If you or I were judged by the Lord right now for every sin, every day, and man, he put it on us every day, we'd be in trouble. Now and then, even to save people with a new nature, we certainly need mercy. And thank God for the Lord who knows how to do it just right. He knows how, you know, not to let things slide. And judgment, if you're going to establish the land, judgment's got to be there. You can't just close your eyes to everything. He understands that. Along with it, on occasion, there's mercy. Oh, that's how the proverb goes, as far as I can tell. Number 29. The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. Now, young men that are strong, I mean, they, they really love to let you know that they are strong. And it says the glory of young men is their strength. I one time worked with a young fellow, and I guess he was probably about 16, 17, 18 years of age. I don't know if he is. I'm not sure he was out of high school yet. And he was a type of fellow that if you told him he couldn't do something, he would die proving to you that he was strong enough to do it. And I've known a couple guys like that. Uh, but this fellow one time, he... He said he could carry five cement bags. Now, I'm not talking about mortar, five bags of mortar. That would be five times seven, 35. And that wouldn't be too awful bad if somebody stacked them up. But 94-pound bags, that would be nearly 500 pounds. And this fellow, I mean, he just, you know, an 18-year-old boy, but he's just one of these guys that if, if you told him he couldn't, he'd be sure that that fellow's going to prove to you he could. And lo and behold, you know, we stacked them up and stacked five bags on that guy, and he staggered around. <laughs> he probably went down, but he toted them things, and I think he must have went about 25 feet with them, or say, yeah, you know, probably about that far, say 20, 25 feet, and proved to us how strong he really was. <laughs> well, what a knucklehead he was, I guess, you know, <laughs> or something, it was crazy, but people are that way. And, uh, you know, to him, that was a glory to him. Well, you take these days, uh, you know, you don't have too much of that going on, but you got, you know, the weightlifting thing. And if a guy, uh, if he's a basketball player and he can bench press 350 pounds, I write an article on, you know, the guy is tremendous, you know, he can, uh, he's not even a weightlifter, but you know, he, he lets you know he can do 350 or 250 or, 
450 or whatever he does, you know, and they glory over that kind of a thing. But, you know, the strange thing is, that might be a glory to a young man, but it doesn't even impress the Lord. Can you imagine that? And to be right frank with you, none of the great athletic achievements that we constantly read about over and over and over again, and some of these guys, you would think that they were just about to be seated, you know, next to the Trinity, if not right in the Trinity. Uh, the Lord's not even impressed. And I'll show you why I say that. Go to Psalm 147. What is it? I guess it's Olympic time now. And everybody going bananas, man, over the Olympics. I guess they're just starting. Winter Olympics. And uh, all the great achievements and all the record-breaking high jumps and sky jumps and long jumps and broad jumps. And uh, I don't know what all they got going, but a million and one things that, that they get their gold and their silver for and doesn't even impress the Lord at all. Uh, 147.10. He delighteth not in the strength of a horse. Now remember, the, you say, well, that says horse, not man. But the comparison is, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. You know where man's strength is at? His legs. You know what enabled that fellow to go about 20 feet with 500 pounds on him? His legs. You know, Paul Anderson, a fellow could lift, what, a, a railroad car off the tracks? He'd get down like that and get all that strength right here. Hit both, and both my legs together wouldn't make one of his. And that fellow get down there and his strength is in his legs and he could put that thing on his back and with those legs just lift it up a little bit off those rails. I forget how much weight the guy lifted. Strength is in your legs. And the Bible, the comparison there is it doesn't even impress the Lord. He doesn't take pleasure in the strength of a horse. He, taketh, uh, he delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. And you always want to remember that. And I'm not belittling uh, the fellows for what they do. I appreciate somebody that's certainly got a lot more talent than I ever had. It's just that uh, it's the world that I'm belittling and all the foolishness they make over it. And they go way too far on it. Now, uh, according to the proverb, to a young man, it's, you know, it's quite a glory. And I guess, oh, as far as the girls are concerned, it's a glory to them. They are very impressed when a young man is strong, not to the Lord. To yourself, it looks like it's still a glory to you and definitely to your ego or uh, I can't say our ego because I don't fall in the category of a young man or a strong man. But to them, the young strong ones, uh, no doubt about it. But just remember, as far as the Lord's concerned, that's not what impresses him. There are other things that do. And it uh, has to do with like the last part of verse number 27. The inward parts of the belly. And that's something else to read about again in the next chapter. Evidently, it's the inside that the Lord is most concerned about. Now, I'm not saying let your bodies fall apart or you have troubles like I've got. You better take care of them. But just remember, you know, keep the perspective right. You don't just, you know, work on one, let the other one, you know, get all dirty and become a shambles inside. Uh, all right, it says, and the beauty of old man is the gray head. Okay, now the stipulation from the Bible would be found in Proverbs 16. And look at verse number 31. We've covered it before. The hoary, that put uh, the color there is kind of a gray, white type of thing. The hoary head is a crown of glory, but here's your stipulation. If it be found in the way of righteousness. And there's nothing any sadder than to see somebody who's got some miles on them, they've been down the road, and they've been around long enough where, you know, the snows of a lot of winters have taken their toll, and their hair's, you know, turned, it's lost its color, and and it'd be described as far as color that way, but don't have any better sense than some of them do. I've seen some of them guys at 60 and 70 years of age, and their mind is like a garbage can. I mean, still curse, still can, can't even talk to them without a dirty remark, a dirty word, a dirty slant. If they don't cuss, they've got a, always got, you know, kind of a tainted kind of a, a conversation. They've always got twofold application. And that's very sad. No glory connected with that if it be found in the way of righteousness. Number 30, and I guess I'll close with verse number 30. And uh, verse number 30 says, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. I was thinking it was the next chapter, but that's it right there. 
One time my daughter was young, little Lisa, still little. She had a bruise on her leg. And she brought, showed to dad, oh dad, you know, my leg, my leg, my leg. And it already, you know, had turned blue. And so when it did, I took the Bible and showed her. I said, well, Lisa, your leg's getting better. And it says, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. And the trouble is, I mean, once it, you know, once you see the blue, you understand things are on the mending side. It's whenever a thing stays red, there's where the evil is or the trouble is. And once I told her that, it kind of seemed to pacify her. And, of course, her leg did get better. But I take that from the Word of God. Now, go to chapter 18, look at verse number 8. The words of a talebearer are his wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Now, remember the last part of the verse here deals with inward parts of the belly. Oh, I hear somebody who is hurting a person and hurting them real deep. They're telling maybe a secret, maybe just something that don't need told. So they're hurting somebody real down deep. Okay, now, it says, As the blueness of the wound cleanses away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. So evidently, chastisement is a must. And as a matter of fact, it must leave its mark. Right here, it's called stripes. And from what I see, it's if you put it on the outside well enough, it seems to have a purifying effect on the inside. That's the way it looks to me. So do stripes. That'll be outward, the inward parts of the belly. And you know, as far as I can see from what you're looking at, verse 27, inward parts of the belly, no doubt about that God is concerned with the inward parts and not the outward. Like the strength of a young man doesn't impress him. And you read, well, we get back to chapter 31, you find out the beauty of a young lady doesn't impress him either. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And so whether you're a man or woman, young or old, make sure that you, you know, keep things in order on the inside. Otherwise, you know, he scourgeth everyone whom he receiveth. And if the Lord has to, he'll show you what stripes and chastisement are really all about. This, the illustration is just like parents who sometimes have to beat a child with a rod. And the Bible says, you know, you've got to do it. And so doing, you spare his soul from hell. Now, when I give an invitation to ask somebody to get saved, they come forward, I'm not going to say, kneel down, now I'm going to get the rod, you know, and you know, beat them, and that's going to, they're going to get saved. It's a thing that if you, you know, if you put it on them, and they learn to, they learn to have respect for their father on earth, Time will come when they'll have respect for their Heavenly Father too, and they'll do what He says and get saved. And so it's necessary. It's necessary for the Lord to do it to us. It's necessary for parents to do it to children. And sometimes it says the stripes, so do stripes, the inward parts of the belly. Remember, the Lord is concerned about the inside more than He's concerned about the outside. Father in heaven, we thank you now for the word of God and ask for something to stick, Lord, that is needed or will be needed. I ask you, Lord, to sanctify what I've said. If I've said anything in error or misled anybody, I ask you, Lord, to scratch it from their mind, from their heart. If it's been true, Lord, just ask you to make it stick and make it be useful and profitable to them. And God, we're asking you for safety as this crowd goes. I ask you, Lord, to keep each one safe. And Lord, know that accidents can happen. And so we just ask you, Lord, to give us protection that we need this evening. And bless, the, bless each one now, even the rest of this week. Pray for Mrs. Smith in the hospital, Lord, and ask that you would give some strength there. Lord, you minister to her. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Better get a little bit of the Bible in here before I talk too much. Proverbs 21. And Proverbs chapter 21, just personal character again, and through the chapter in chapter 22. A 
Uh, chapter 21 now in verse number 1. We finished up last time in chapter 20, and so we'll start 21-1 without any review of any sort. But it just says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Okay, that being true, then I guess you might say you could even tie it together with the things that I said. And the Lord's able to work in supernatural ways, and you can take that thing as far as the providence of God is concerned, and it'll hold as far as the scriptures uh, uh, would be concerned. Look at Esther chapter 6, and here's a case here where uh, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. See how it goes. Esther chapter 6 and verse 1, it's a familiar story to you, should be familiar. This is the story of a king who couldn't sleep. Got a big old long name. And uh, that night he seemed like the night hours, they were passing real slow and a long, long night for him. Wasn't sick, he just couldn't sleep. You ever get that way, your sleep breaks from you? That's the way he was. Uh, Esther chapter 6 and verse 1 says, On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on king Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Well, you know the story. That thing amounts to the physical salvation as far as the Jews are concerned, as far as Mordecai is concerned himself. It amounts to the physical destruction upon the man thought that sought to destroy the Jews. A man who's a type of the Antichrist, old wicked Haman. You start all the way back in chapter number 3, and that fellow, he is, he is determined to destroy the Jews. You talk about anti-Semitic, he most definitely is. He's got a day set, he's determined to do it, he's got everything going his way, and he's going to wipe them out. He doesn't like Mordecai, he doesn't like anybody that even uh, closely resembles him or is kin to him or even a kinsman according to the flesh. He's going to wipe out the Jews. And you know what the Lord did? He just took the king's heart, put a squeeze on it. And the king couldn't sleep. So he calls for somebody to come in and do some reading for him. And finally, something was called to his attention that he should have known about before. Nobody ever told him. But you see, the Lord just let it slide until prime time, when the need was there, the Lord came through. Okay, if you didn't have another verse in the Bible to show you that, that shows you the Proverbs true. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Okay, now, if that's true then, you say, well, I, you know, I was way back before Jesus Christ. Sure was. But you know, the Lord, he's... Uh, He's not like you and I. He doesn't get old. You're talking about the everlasting God. And uh, you're talking about the one the Bible calls him the Ancient of Days, but his, his strength doesn't ever fail. He doesn't ever get weary. He no, never any lack of power. Uh, he doesn't weaken along any lines. Not at all. Not a fraction. And that being true, if you doubt it, you read Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26 to 28. There is no lack and no shortage in any way. All right, if that's true, you think he could work for you and I and our church? He's done it. And in the case of some of you people, maybe there are situations in your home, in your family, where you need something. And you've done everything you can do, and humanly speaking, you have, and even as a Christian, you've done everything you can do, and there's still a need. Okay, you know who's going to have to do it? The Lord. And I'll tell you something. If he can do it with the king, he can do it with anybody you know and I know. He can put the squeeze on him, he can turn him around and like you wouldn't believe. And he's got all kinds of ways of doing it. I mean, he can take somebody and he can get the, take their sleep from them. He can take somebody and he can get their attention on a dark and lonely night out in the road, you know, in a one-car crash. He can get their attention right now. Lord has all kinds of ways of doing it. Just want you to know that he does. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so I don't want you to quit praying. And you know, some situations that, you know, maybe they didn't begin right, it's going to take a lot of prayer to get them, get them turned around, but the Lord can do it. And you know, a lot of people, a lot of times people want to give up, but you can't give up. You can't quit praying. And the Lord's able to do what you can't do. And uh, there, you know, there's nobody can get outside of God. You, you ever think of that? There's nobody can get outside of God. They can get outside of you and me. That's not hard to do. I mean, that's real easy to do as far as I'm concerned. 
and uh, but not the Lord. So uh, that being true, y'all just keep praying. You hear? Some of you moms and dads, you gonna keep praying? And some of you people, it's, you know, been a long time since you've worked. You gonna keep praying? The Lord's able to work unusual ways. Unusual ways. He can just put you right back on somebody that you've talked to and you think, man, they've got 500 resumes and 500 applications and, and uh, they'll they forget me the minute I walk out that door. And the Lord can just take and put a squeeze on somebody's heart and stop, who's that person? What's that person? I remember what the name was? And, and start filing through a bunch of leaflets there and come up with a name and it'll be your name. The Lord can do all that. And don't you ever forget it. Uh, I'll show you another situation. Go to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra. That's uh, just back a couple little books there from Esther. Probably 25 pages. Ezra chapter 1. Here's a direct statement like this. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Look what you read here. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Imagine that. I mean Persian king. I mean Ahasuerus. I mean not even talking about uh, king of Israel or Judah. Talking about Cyrus, king of Persia. Man, Lord can work with anybody. Cyrus, king of Persia. Then he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Put it also in writing saying, head on back to Jerusalem. Get that house built up again. In effect. Not too bad, is it? That just about encourage a Christian, wouldn't it? What does it say? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Now, you know, sometimes when it seems like things are going against you, the Lord can even turn that kind of thing around, and really it's not. I'll give you an example. Take the example in Luke chapter number 2. In Luke chapter number 2, you know, uh, there's a decree went out, uh, Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. And, you know, that situation included Joseph and Mary, and she was great with child. And it looked like as far as the birth of Christ is concerned, man, it, it's never going to be like Micah said. There's just no way. And it looked like she'd never make the trip. It looked like, man, it's not going to be it. And you know something? Because the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, it took place where it was supposed to. Uh, it didn't take place ten miles before or five miles before. Right exactly a little old town, a little among thousands of Judah. You know, a little old bitty town. I look on Atlas Iladassian where a guy shot a a 14-year-old kid got a big old buck this year in Guernsey County in a place called Chesterland. And I never heard of it. And I asked Pop. He never heard of it. I look it on the map, and I don't even know if it's down there. i seen Chesterland and Ashtabula County, but never not down in Guernsey County. And uh, I don't know, maybe just a little, you know, just a little bitty spot. Just, you know, I mean, amongst all the thousands in Ohio, there's little spots here and little ones there. And Westchester, a guy took a 19-pointer and here and there, and you know, getting them everywhere, you know. Little bitty spots. Well, there's a little spot there where, you know, the... The Lord Jesus, the ruler, was supposed to be born. And you never think it ever come to pass. But don't kid yourself. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so you just, you know, you keep going to, going to the Lord, send the prayers up to heaven, and uh, you, you can be sure the Lord's going to do something. You sure about it? Now, you know what I've given you? I've given you three straight illustrations from the Bible. And that establishes a fact, plus the proverb itself. Okay, it says, uh, as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. He can turn it to you, from you, any way he wants to do it. Now, as rivers of water. Now, you know the Lord, he knows how to make rivers too. And uh, sometime I'm going down through all oh, Dover and I follow Tuscarawas River. And I go through Philly and Tuscarawas River. And I go through Goshen, Tuscarawas River. And I go through Tuscarawas and... Oh, believe it or not, Tuscarawas River. I get clear down Ganade and Hutton, and man, there's Tuscarawas River. And that thing, you know, it just winds, you wouldn't believe it, man, it just winds every which way. And you know, that's the Lord. He can just turn that thing just any way he wants to. I mean, sometimes that thing just goes like this, you know, right around the curve. And other times, you know, you can just look down through there and just see it shooting down there. And, you know, down in Florida one time they had a river, and I think it might be called Kissimmee or something like that. That might not be it, but I'm going to tell you the story. And there was a, a river down there, and that thing that just went like this and went into, I think it was Lake Okeechobee. And so the brilliant scientists, they, you know, figure out, we ought to straighten that thing out. And, um, you know, man, we really could do something. That just winded around too much, and they did. They straightened it out. They spent millions and billions of dollars in straightening that river out and 
shot that thing right straight in Lake Okeechobee, and guess what happened? All the fish began to die in Lake Okeechobee. <laughs> you believe that? That's true. It's a fact. That's Reader's Digest, National Geographic, or something like that. You know why they died? Because these guys putting all the stuff on their alfalfa and corns and beans and uh, tomatoes and everything. They're putting all that their uh, spray insecticide on it. And that thing being so straight, it was flowing so fast, it was just wash, taking all that stuff and washing it right in the lake, and the fish were dying. You know what they had to do? They had to undo that. And they had to direct that thing back around the way the Lord made it, you know, this way, and slow the flow down, and this way, and that way, and the fish began to live again. And you know, that's the Lord. He knows how to make a river. And he knows how to turn it, make just the right turn at the right spot. And he knows how to take King's heart and do the same thing to you or away from you if, you know, it's working against you. Lord knows how to do that. And just because I read stuff that's, you know, a couple thousand years old or better, 2,500 years old in the Bible, that doesn't mean he can't do it today. He can. And so I know you all have lots of needs out there. And I just want you to want to remind you about the proverb. It's a great encouragement for you. Stay with it, you hear? The Lord will come through for you like he does for others. Number two, it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the heart. Now, in pondereth the heart, I guess it's a thing, well, look at chapter 24, verse 12, and no question about it, it's the way he operates. He doesn't just look at, you know, surface. He looks on the inside. He doesn't just see how things are going here or there. He, he takes a look and see just what's going on in the inside. Look at 11 of chapter 24. If thou prepare to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? You know, the Lord just, he just sits in heaven there and he just kind of looks around down here and sort of takes a look on the inside. Just ponders your heart. He sort of weighs things out. Look at chapter 16, verse number 2. All the ways of man clean his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. He just sort of puts them in there and puts the Bible on one side and puts the Lord Jesus on one side and puts you and your spirit on the other side and just sort of weighs it. And you know, one day you get to the judgment, you're going to find out that you know things are going to be measured not by the outside, but by the inside. And just how they measured up and how they fared by Jesus and the Word of God. And, uh, you know, you and I, we can make a million excuses and we can justify ourselves. And, and just uh, unbelievable, absolutely un unbelievable. To the, you know, you'd say, well, part of the ways of man are right in his own eyes. But I wish that proverb wasn't in there. I really don't like that too well. Personally, it kind of, it says every way, every way. Do you ever notice how you can justify everything you do? Everything. There's always a reason. I mean, I come slide in here five minutes late and I, I can justify, you know, because I just, you know, I had a lot to do and I was just doing one more thing and I'm five minutes late. No, forget it, man. You should have let it set, discipline yourself and come in five minutes early. You know, but you always, there's always something. Every time, always, you ever find yourself that way? <clears throat> yeah, okay, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Uh, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. So the Lord, he just takes a look around the inside, and he just weighs things out, and his deduction will be right. All it says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Now, in the Bible, you find that sometimes people want to sacrifice and not be just. And you know, Christians are even that way today. Sometimes, instead of handling matters justly or weighing things out and trying to be as just as you can in a situation. Somebody feels like, you know, well, they don't make any difference, man. I give my tithe. I pay my tithe. You know, that's their old Old Testament saying there. And somebody's paying tithe, and you know, not paying anything under grace. You give cheerfully. Hope, I hope you do, anyhow. And, uh, but, you know, the Lord's more interested in, in some justice and judgment. And Jesus even answered mercy, added mercy to that thing in Matthew chapter 23. And as uh, far as he's concerned, these are what he calls the weightier matters of the law. Justice and judgment. 
sacrifice, you know, just given. And I, again, I'm thankful for everything comes in. And I'm sure Brother Brislin and Brother Harold and uh, fellows that's connected with the monies and trying to use it right, I'm sure they are too. And I'm sure you are. Uh, but you know, you can't just stop there. And number one, I mean, there, there are folks there that you take King Saul, he kept trying that kind of thing. He got rebuked for it and lost the kingdom over it. And he kept on sacrificing, but it wasn't what the Lord asked for. You know, the Lord said to obey is better than sacrifice. You know what he told the Pharisees? I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. You know what he's doing? He's quoting a verse out of Hosea. And you know, the Lord, he doesn't just buy just sacrifice. Now, sacrifice in the Bible has got its place. I mean, there's sacrifice as far as your lips are concerned. Under certain conditions, giving thanks to his name, that's sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 13. And it has its place, but it's not just sacrifice. Uh, You've got to be just as far as judgment's concerned in the Bible. Otherwise, it not, it's not going to work. Now, take the fellow that wrote this. Stop and think. All right, he says, justice and judgment more acceptable, Lord, than sacrifice. You know what he's involved in? He's involved in situation and dedication of the temple there, 1 Kings chapter 8. There's a verse back there. It says they offered so many animals for a sacrifice, so many animals there. At that dedication, the Bible says they couldn't be told or numbered. I mean, by the thousands. And he pretty wise in saying, that's quite a sacrifice. I mean, you stop and think of the animals and what the value would be. And that many thousand animals... And offer, and here he comes in here and says, Justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Ooh, wow. Kind of get it? You know, take that comparison. I'd help you get a handle on it. Well, at least don't forget it. Number four, it says, A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Look at chapter 24, verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. The thought. The thought, just the very thought itself. Back there in chapter 21, it said, A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin, implying that somebody that's lost, they can't do anything right. He said, I don't believe that. Oh, well, it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not. It's what it says. You'd have to deduct from that that the Lord calls them close, wouldn't you? The thought of foolishness is sin. The act is, no question about that, but you don't need the Bible to tell you that. You need the Bible to tell you that the thought of foolishness is sin. That's the Lord. Now, in the passage here in chapter 21, the first thing the text does is establish the character of the man. Before anything else is determined, what kind of a person is it? And here's somebody who's wicked, so then the thing naturally follows, it's like Jesus said, an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. That's the way the verse goes, just like Jesus said. You say, oh, Brother Martin, I know some guy, he's a drunken. Why? Uh, he puts money in uh, St. Joseph for Children's uh, Fund. Don't tell me that's not good. Don't tell me that's sin. Yeah, that's sin. And the Bible tells you it is. See, you and I, we never get that. We get the idea that he's contributing to charity. He's contributing to an orphanage. I mean, so what if he got that money, you know, from uh, somebody's paycheck or she went home and bought milk and he bought booze with it? So what? I mean, he's giving it to children. And, you know, he's a good man. I don't care if he does run a bar. Wicked is the word. And uh, the first thing that text does is establish the character. And if it's a wicked person, it says, uh, Plowing of the wicked is sin. They can't do anything right. 